Hello, and welcome to our third in our Cosmology series. This one is called Giving To, Not Giving Up. Now, there is this word, sacrifice, that you will hear a lot in ADF um, and anywhere where you do any studies of the ancient world. Now, this word, sacrifice, has become quite negative. It, think of, of talking about soldiers in battle making the ultimate sacrifice. But it could even be as simple as, uh, say, he sacrificed his career to stay home and take care of the children. Or to save enough money for Christmas presents, she gave up her night out with the girls. In any case, the word sacrifice nowadays pretty much means giving up something, right? But this, this giving up stuff hasn't been around all that long. The oldest I, uh, reference I could find was 1706, and that meant surrender, give up, and suffer to be lost. But that's not the way the ancients saw it at all. Now, let's look at the etymology, you know, the, the meaning of the word and where it comes from and what its roots are and all the rest of that. I love that stuff. But you can learn a lot from doing etymology. Now, if you'll remember from a, an earlier video, I said that the Proto-Indo-European root word sec meant to cut away or to cut away from ordinary reality. Remember that? Well, sec fits into sacrifice as well because sec was the basis for the word sacred. Now, the word sacrifice comes from two Latin words. One is sacer, which means sacred, and the other is facere, to make or to do. So what sacrifice actually means, literally is, to make something cut off from ordinary reality, to ritually set it apart. So it is to do this thing, not just this thing is, but to do it, to make it sacred. Does that make sense? All right. Now this modern negative meaning is actually due to Christianity. Um, in their mythology, uh, Christ died on the cross. And it was said that this was the last sacrifice ever needed because it was the culmination of all the sacrifices performed in the temple in Jerusalem in the Old Testament. Okay, well the upshot of this is that Sacrifice became equated with, you know, dying on crosses, which is, I expect, rather uncomfortable. And so it became negative for that reason. But that's not at all what it was in the ancient world. The ancient idea was forming reciprocity by sharing food and items with the gods and with other people. And when you think about it, an ancient animal sacrifice was really just a great big barbecue. If you eat meat at all, then you really have no leg to stand on to condemn the ancients for killing an animal so that they could eat the meat. Now something I want to do now is uh, show you a little quote from the Iliad. It's uh, book 23 and it is the goddess Iris speaking. And she says, no time for sitting now. No, I must return to the ocean's running stream, the Ethiopian's land. They are making a splendid sacrifice to the gods and I must not miss my share of the sacred feast. So here you can see that the goddess Iris didn't wanna miss out because she got to eat. She got to have some of this great offering that was going to be made. Okay. So ancient sacrifice was part of the reciprocal relationship between people and the gods, as well as between people. There is a, there is a um, Latin ritual phrase, doat des, which means I give so that you may give, which really works here. Now notice I said may give, not must give or shall give or will give. We give so that others might give back to us. And, and it's not a transaction. It's not going to the store and buying something, okay? This is the way friendship is put together. You see, 
in a, in a real reciprocal relationship, we all help each other. And that leads to community. And community allows us all to work together to support and help each other. There's a famous line that Benjamin Franklin said back when uh, they were signed in the Declaration of Independence. And that was, gentlemen, we must all hang together or most assuredly, we will all hang separately. Yes, no man is an island. And you also, you have to remember that the gods have agency. They have the ability to act and use their own will. And we pagans know that there is no all-powerful god because they have to submit to the laws of physics. The gods are part of this world. They are here with us. And so they are subject to the same laws that we're subject to. And something which sort of points this out is um, the problem of evil. When you look at uh, the Abrahamic religions, their God is all powerful, he's all good, and he's always around, okay? Well, what happens happened in the Holocaust when God's chosen people, the Jews, were hauled off to concentration camps by the millions. Where was their God then? You see, the ancients knew that sometimes bad stuff happened to good people, you know, and it, nothing could be done about it. So it was important to stay on the good side of the gods because maybe they could help out. Now, the gods have more power than we do, but you know, they can only help us within limits, like the laws of physics require. They can nudge things. They can help things happen. But they aren't like this so-called um, God who lives outside of the universe and is so all-powerful because of the uh, problem of evil. The gods and the spirits are of this world. They're not outside of it. And the, if the gods help us, it's because of the, law, the laws of reciprocity. Okay, let's take a second. And what do we know about gods from all the ancient lores and texts? Well, the gods are undying. Now, Balder notwithstanding, you've got to remember that um, most of these tales in the north of Europe, uh, Norse, Celtic, uh, were written by Christians. And although they wanted to preserve the lore and, and the stories, they didn't want to offend the new religion or their idea of what the religion was. And so as a result, they turned all the gods and spirits, not all the time, but most of the time, turned the gods and spirits into people, you know, nobles or kings or something like that. And uh, this Christian influence colors what we've got. Okay, another thing about the gods, they were ever young. Now in the Norse tradition, uh, they had to eat the apples of Iduna to stay young. And if somebody stole those apples away from them, they were in a lot of trouble. But in general, everywhere, the gods are ever young. You don't hear about a god getting old. Um, if their God is a cosmic type of God, like, you know, the moon or the sun, then they had untiring stamina. They could just keep going and going and going, you know, like the um, Energizer Bunny. Uh, and some gods never sleep. There are three Vedic gods that are very much like this, Ariman, Varuna, and Mitra, but even in the Greeks, in one Greek play, Zeus is described as having the eye of Zeus does not sleep. And maybe even Odin, who has a seat on Yggdrasil, and he can see all the worlds at the same time, which implies that he keeps an eye on things. So who knows? Does Odin sleep? And then, of course, in the Welsh, there's Mathap Mathonwi, who is said to hear whispers on the wind so that nothing happens that he doesn't know about. That kind of implies that he doesn't sleep either. We don't know that, but it's a possibility. Now, a lot of gods are described by epithets. An epithet is really um, a description, 
more than a name like, you know, John or Mary, right? Uh, in the Norse, there's Frey and Freya. Now, their names literally translate as Lord and Lady. Uh, Rome had a god that was nameless. Well, it had a name, but you, you never were allowed to utter it, and it wasn't written down anywhere, because this god protected Rome from its enemies, and if an enemy learned the name, they could then use that against Rome. Um, let's see, uh, the Dogda in Ireland. The Dogda, his name literally means good god, as in, you know, he's good at many things. Not that he's necessarily the nicest of guys, although he could be. Uh, and even in Welsh, Hrianon comes from Rigantona, which means great queen. So we know that gods are very often described in their own names. Uh, but the big thing is that gods give good things. This is reciprocity and sacrifice. Okay, there are four main contexts for sacrifice. Uh, why you would do, why sacrifice existed. The first is delivering services through gifts. Now that's not a, a quid pro quo we're talking about, but, and that is what the majority of, of the rest of this video will be about. Uh, also commensality, which is essentially community. Um, the next two though, uh, are protection, sacrifice leading to protection, which is the next video. And after that is sacrifice leading to sustaining the cosmos, which is the, will be the video after that. Now, delivering services through gifts. As I said, this is not transactional um, because friendship, which is what a reciprocal a relationship really is, is based on fellow feeling. It is not what we can get from one another. It is not how we can profit from someone else. A friend gives when asked, and sometimes even when not asked. See, gift giving is the basis of reciprocity. Now, the things that you can give to the gods, in particular, are material things, like some possession or food, something you have. Another thing can be non-material. These things are like a song or a story or just fulsome praise. And a, the, another thing is a less tangible thing like love and concern. But all of these are good things to give. And not just to the gods, but to each other as well. But there's a little thing here. If we only give for the joy of giving, how can we ask for anything at all? <laughs> okay, we don't ask for something back every time we give something first, okay? Because that's transactional. We share our lives with our friends and they share their lives with us, unasked. Now, should we actually need something, the chances are really good that we will get what we need, assuming we ask. But again, there are no guarantees. I want to quote another uh, bit from the Poetic Edda. It's from the Lay of Hindla, and it's the little section where Freya agrees to help Otar. And it goes, he a high altar made me of heaped stones. All glary have grown the gathered rocks. What she's saying here is that Otar made Freya a great pile of stones that he used as an altar, okay? And that these, these stones have become all glary. And glary means glaring or painfully bright. And redden anew them with Neat's fresh blood. She's saying here that regularly he made an animal sacrifice and the blood poured on the stones. For I believed Otar in the Isonur. Isonur are the goddesses. So she's saying that because he believed in her and other goddesses, he built a great altar of stones. He made animal sacrifices on it, all to her, and as a result, since he never asked for anything, she sort of felt obligated 
to give him something. Now, Otar came to Freya and he needed to find something out from his past that he didn't know. And Freya, being kind of obligated, agreed to do it. Uh, but of course, he didn't realize that how she was going to do it was to turn him into a boar and then ride him down to a, a giantess who actually knew the answer. And then she was going to have a conversation with the giantess and uh, Otar could overhear what the answer would be. <laughs> um, the poetic edda doesn't mention uh, how Otar felt about being turned into a boar, but there we are. Anyway, an important thing about these gifts is they must be connected to the giver. If you're going to give something, it has to be of you. It has to be something that you have a right to give. Okay? A gift must be part of yourself. Otherwise, it isn't yours to give, is it? Now, there's a little analogy I always like to talk about that, um, <laughs> that is pretty good. It's, I call it the birthday party analogy. Imagine for a moment that a friend of yours is having a birthday party because it's his birthday and it's gonna be at his house. So you show up early and say hi and all that and then you lose him somewhere so that you can go through all the cupboards and the closets until you find something you think he might like and then you give him that for his birthday. It isn't yours to give. He already has it. That would be dumb. Um, a way to demonstrate this analogy is sometimes, oh, I've seen this happen in rituals. Someone is going to go to the ritual and, oh, they want to give something, but they forgot to bring something. You know, this happens. So they kind of go out in the field and start um, pulling up wildflowers or something, something that is naturally there. And then they want to give that. Well, the problem with that is those wildflowers that they picked are not theirs to give. Giving nature's flowers back to nature doesn't work. It's not yours. Now, if you grew these flowers, if you, even the wild ones, if you went out and you cultivated them and you fertilized them and you mulched them nicely and watered them so that they really grew well and strong, you have now altered those flowers. You have made them of you. And as a result, they would be appropriate to give. This gift must be connected to the giver. Now, if you look at this, that the gift being connected to the giver, then the very best gift you could probably give to the gods is yourself. Well, the problem with that is, of course, that if you gave yourself then you wouldn't be around to partake of any blessing that you might get. And so I want to read you a little something also um, by Livy uh, describing a Roman named Decius Mus. He was at a time, living at a time when Rome wasn't all that secure, early in the BCs, uh, and he saw that Rome was having a battle. Rome had been sacked once by the Gauls already, and now there was a combined force of the Gauls and the Samnites, some, an Italian tribe, who were out there, and Rome was very fearful that these guys would come in and sack the city of Rome. And Dacius Mus decided that he was gonna do something about that. And so, before this great battle, he put on ritual clothing, and then he went to the priests. And as Livy says in his History of Rome, book 10, verse 28, Decius Mus declared, now I will offer the legions of the enemy together with myself as a sacrifice to Tellus and the Diamanes. What he's saying is, is that he is going to offer himself as well as the enemy to the infernal gods of the underworld and to the, the um, furies, as it were. Now Libby goes on. After the usual prayers had been recited, 
he uttered the following curse. I carry before me terror and rout and carnage and blood and the wrath of the gods, those above and those below. So he's calling upon the gods up in the, in the heavens, in on Olympus, and he's also calling to the gods of the underworld and the gods of the dead. I will infect the standards, the armor, the weapons of the enemy with dire and manifold death. So what he's saying here, he's not only cursing his enemies, he's cursing their weapons and their banners and all of their stuff so that all of it will be destroyed. Then he says, the place of my destruction shall also witness that of the Gauls and Samnites. And so here he's saying that when he dies, they'll all die as well. Well, what Dishusmus did is he rode unarmed into the center of the worst of the battle, into the center of the Gaulish line, and was almost immediately killed. But the Romans won the battle. Of course, as I said before, the only problem with giving yourself, which is the best thing you can possibly give, is that you won't be around to get the blessings. So the ancients came up with a way around this. It's called substitution. What they decided you could do is you would offer something, if you couldn't offer yourself, you would offer something as close as possible to yourself. And in the early days, these good things that are closest to you would be um, family members or slaves or prisoners of war. And in the um, case of, of a, uh, sta a scapegoat, it would be a volunteer possibly. Well, this is human sacrifice and they got over that really pretty early on because you know it's really bad for society and people get all upset when you go kill you know aunt clara you know just for the for the gods and it really wasn't a good thing so they said okay what's next that we could offer besides other people and what they came up with was things like domestic animals especially some that were good to eat now this brings us to sacrifice through killing. Now, when you're gonna kill an animal to eat them, why would you do that? Well, for the gods, your offering should attract their attention, uh, delighting them, and maybe they reward us, okay? So there's another little thing from the Rig Veda that I also want to show you. And it goes, for you alone are these ample beakers, milked by stones and resting in cups, the draughts of Indra. Attain them, satisfy your desire for them, and then put your mind to giving goods. <laughs> now, they're not saying that because we're giving you this stuff, you've got to give us what we want. No, they're not saying that at all. They're saying, hey, look, we're giving you this wonderful soma that has been pressed by stones and which is in individual cups just for you. And it's the thing that Indra likes best. And so while you're drinking it, you know, you know remember that we're still here and uh, maybe think about you might want to give us something if you want. Okay, so the main part, the main benefit of an animal sacrifice was also in creating community. Okay, because what they would do is they would invite the gods to dinner, as it were. They'd kill the animal, they'd cook it, they'd give part to the gods, and then the rest of it, they'd share and have a, have a great big barbecue with everybody, and you know, Something people really like to do is to get together and eat together, right? Not only though, in this situation, are they the people eating together, but the gods are eating with them. The gods are guests. You see, feasting together strengthens community. And when you also share with the gods, they're your guests and the whole laws of hospitality apply. 
Now, sharing with the gods strengthens the guest host relationship of hospitality, and it automatically initiates reciprocity. Now, killing animals and having a great barbecue and sharing your food with the gods wasn't the only way that people did sacrifice. Oh, not by a long shot. It was rather expensive to do. Um, it could be anything of value, uh, but the gift not only must be of you, but it must also be dedicated to the gods and spirits. And to make it valid, the gift has to go out of human use. It's not a case of, of offering a steak to the gods and saying, isn't this great? I'm giving you this. And then taking it back and eating it yourself. That doesn't work. That is not giving the gift. There's a, a bunch of interesting examples of uh, archaeologists finding some of these gifts that have been given in the past. Uh, in, in northern Wales, there's a lake called Llyn Bach. Now, this lake is at the end of a Royal Air Force runway. And during the Second World War, they needed to lengthen the runway because planes were getting bigger or heavier or whatever, but it wasn't long enough. So the trouble is the lake's in the way and the other end wasn't appropriate. So what they had to do was dredge all the soft, gooey stuff out of the bottom of the lake, and then they could, you know, throw in rocks and dirt and stuff to, to make the runway longer. The thing is, when they dredged this lake, they found 138 ancient objects that had been thrown in. Things like swords, often broken, because when you break the sword, you you are uh, killing it. <laughs> they found pommels, they found spears, they found shield bosses, they found chariot parts, they found currency bars, and they even found a bronze trumpet. <laughs> I mean, this is some pretty neat stuff. And the thing is, this lake isn't the only one. They have found lakes full of this stuff all over Europe. But the Celts like to throw their offerings into bodies of water. That isn't the only place they put them, though. Um, they would put them in their temples, uh, something that even uh, other cultures did as well. There's a, a Roman writer named Diodorus Siculus who wrote that the Celts displayed the gold they had received or conquered in temples, untouched. No one dared touch them because to do that would bring, upon, bring down the wrath of the gods. And Strabo, another, another Roman writer, wrote that they would take treasures and throw them into lakes. Now, oh, it was great. It was nice and safe, I suppose, except when the Romans conquered the area, they didn't believe in the Celtic gods. They didn't care. So they would auction off the lakes to wealthy people who then could dredge the lakes and get all the good loot. So you can't win them all. But even so, there's another kind of offering made that was extremely common. And that kind of offering was the libation. A libation is where you've got a, a cup or something full of, of a drink, perhaps, or sometimes oil or sometimes honey for different uses. And you pour this on the ground. That's what a libation is. And it's one of the most common forms of sacrifice. Now, in ancient Greece, a libation was the absolute minimum that you needed to make a supplication, you know, to ask for something, right? Now, the, the Greek words, I won't go into that, but the Greek words actually meant for libation, actually meant to pour an offering. And it also meant to make a pact. So we see some reciprocity thing going on here. Um, libations could be poured to the earth. They could be poured to the dead because, you know, the dead are always thirsty. Um, and you would do a small libation. It shows up in the Iliad very well. You could make a small libation for protection. Um, in the Iliad, after uh, Achilles has killed Hector, um, Hector's father, the, the king of Troy, Priam, makes a libation to Zeus to pray that he would be able to retrieve his son's body. 
Now elsewhere, a little later, or actually before that, Achilles makes a small libation to ask the gods for the protection for Patroclus, who had donned Achilles' armor and was going to go out and make everybody think that Achilles was there. Okay? Uh, it didn't work for Achilles. It did work for Priam. But large libations could also be made, and that was usually for a very important reason or for an important hope. And I have a story to tell. <laughs> Doesn't always work, but there's a festival back east called Starwood, and uh, all kinds, hundreds and hundreds of people would show up to this thing, and it was a music festival, and there was a lot of pagan stuff, but there would always be this opening rite, and because all kinds of people were there, it would be a mix of traditions, right? They'd, they'd cast a circle, they'd call quarters, and then, since the organizers were ADF, they would then make offerings to the ancestors, the, people, the spirits of the land, and the gods and goddesses. Well, this one year, I was asked to do the, the offering to the gods and goddesses. Well, the weather report was dire, absolutely dire. It was supposed to rain and storm all that coming weekend. And so I decided I'm going to do this right. And I took a full, unopened bottle of Tully Moore Dew whiskey, and I went to the right, and I made my invocation to the gods, and I poured the entire bottle on the ground. <laughs> you should have seen everybody's faces. <laughs> They're all going, oh, what are you doing? And I overheard someone uh, say to somebody else, well, that's those druids for you. They're always doing stuff like this. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, well, it didn't work, but that's a use for a libation. Now, the offerings for a libation could be alcohol. Wine was very common. Beer was very common. Uh, but it could also be hoy oil or honey. Now, why oil? Well, it's in Greece and in other places. There were special stones. Maybe they'd be by um, a crossroads or maybe in some sacred place. And passers-by would make offerings of oil to this stone, and these stones would glisten in the light. Perhaps the reason for this was they were upholding and sustaining the cosmos. That's a possibility. Hard to say, but they might have been. Uh, we know in the Baltics, offerings were made to Zemanele, who's the goddess of the earth. Now, there's another kind of offering we have to talk about. And these are votive offerings. Now, a votive offering is a, an offering that is made in the result of a vow. It's an if-then kind of offering. Sort of like, if, O oh gods, you do this for me, then I will do this for you. So in this case, you're asking for it first, and if they come through, you're promising to do something for them. Does that make sense? Um, Things that uh, could be given are um, altars and shrines. I have a story here. <laughs> After, when I built my very first stone circle in Tucson, Arizona, uh, the Grove had never had more than like eight people attend a high day. And this thing was gorgeous that I had built. And I really, really wanted people to come for the first ritual we were gonna hold in it, which was in bulk. So we had a rehearsal that day and it was cloudy, and the clouds were not just there, they were thick, and they were hanging low. And this is Tucson, it never rains in Tucson, but while we were re rehearsing, it was spitting and spotting, you know, a, sort of a misty rain coming down. And everybody else went in at the end of the rehearsal, and I stayed back, and I took whiskey, and I offered it to the fire to the god Tyrannus, the god of storms, and I said, great Lord, if you will make the weather good tonight so that people will come, then I'll, I'll, I'll build you an altar. <laughs> okay? Well, that night, it looked terrible. It looked like it was going to rain at any time. But we had about 25, 30 people show up. I was really happy about it. 
And so the ritual's going on and we get to the section where we open the gates to the other worlds. We open the gates and at that very moment, the sun slipped from behind the clouds in the, in the west and promptly lit up the mountains in the east. A great rainbow appeared over the stone circle and birds began to fly around the stone circle as well. I was stuck. <laughs> You couldn't get a better omen than that. So I ended up building him a shrine, my very first one. And I built quite a few since. Well, other things that you could promise to give would be a big animal sacrifice once the crisis was passed and you succeeded in whatever that crisis was. Um, temples might be offered slaves or perhaps a herd of animals that they could keep and breed and make money on and, you know, use for sacrifices, etc. cetera. Uh, people would uh, offer garments or perhaps even tracts of land to temples. Um, but another thing would be objects made by hand. And you find lots of little objects offered to the gods. Uh, these things would end up going into a temple or shrine. If they were valuable, they'd probably end up in what uh, the temples had called a treasury. If not, they might sit around on an altar for a while. That's what we do now. But, you know, it's hard to say, but they used to give these things. And if it was a healing temple, very often what people would give would be models of the body part <clears throat> that was having problems, okay? Another story. In 1973, I was in Corinth with a friend and uh, we had a driver. I was only 21 and, you know. Anyway, we had a driver and this driver knew somebody at the museum in Corinth. And there is this room in the museum in the back that's locked that tourists aren't allowed into, okay? Well, the driver said, let me see what I can do. I got something neat you really want to see. And I went, okay. And they led us into this room. What this room was, was wall-to-wall -wall votive offerings, but not just any votive offerings. It was primarily diseased body parts, and almost all of them were penises, breasts, um, female parts, um, behinds, uh, all kinds of stuff, and the walls were covered with them, hundreds and hundreds of them. It was quite an eye-opener. I had no idea at that time that such things existed. So reciprocity permeated ancient cultures and formed the entire basis of society. And that's what we do as pagans in ADF. Now, my next two um, videos will be first, the nature of sacrifice for protection and then the next one after that will be the nature of sacrifice for sustaining the cosmos. And so thank you very much.